Easter, everybody. It's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, March 27th, 2016. <laughs> Usually when I watch an episode of YNR, I watch the whole show, I watch the previews, and then I turn it off and go about my business and do whatever it is I need to do. But when an episode is real good, <laughs> I let the credits roll and I just sit there and I think and I'm stunned. And let me tell you, baby, I let those credits roll roll on Friday. I sat there, I think, with my mouth open, and it felt like that the entire week. It wasn't just Friday's episode. It was almost every single episode. The journey of this week had me in tears, had me angry, had me feeling offended, had me clapping and laughing and squealing, and of course, just left me stunned. I mean, by, by Friday, I just sat there and let that theme song wash over me <laughs> and just appreciated the fact that I am a YNR fan. I mean, what a great week to be a YNR fan. There were so many big reveals, big moments, amazing character developments, and I thought, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, uh, well, what, what could be bigger than them redoing Catherine's mansion? I mean, believe me, I wanted to open up talking about that, but I have to talk about the trial of the century. I mean, uh, did I say that I don't like trials? I think that was somebody else because this was amazing. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> I mean, I, I'm gonna assume you saw it because if you didn't see it, you better go back and you better watch Thursday's show, you better watch Friday's show, and your homework is to come back bright and early on Monday morning and be at your set ready to watch Monday's show because this is epic. It is epic. I mean, I understand where everyone is coming from. I, I, I mean, it is literally the world versus Victor Newman. And I can put myself so easily in every single person's shoes. I understand entirely why any and all of these people would hate that man. Everybody has a reason to hate Victor or to feel hurt by Victor or to have a mix of love and hate toward Victor. The piece that I was struggling to put together was Victor and his frame of mind. I never know where that man is coming from. I mean, pretty much through most of even Thursday's show, through the testimonies and just hearing everyone present their side, present their relationship with Victor, I, I didn't, I, I just, again, kind of let that wash over me and I understood it. But the, the plot that was, it was driving me crazy, it was nagging me in the back of my head is how is Victor gonna get out of this? What is, what is he planning? What is he thinking? And the best I can figure is that Victor had a series of plans that may or may not work out for him. I think Victor had a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. <laughs> when plan A and B blew up, he unleashed plan C, which I honestly did not see coming. I mean, the very end of Friday's show was like, whoa? I, 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 I think I, I couldn't even, I, I was in a cloud of haze. Plan A was Adam. Plan B was Michael in a mistrial. Plan C was Luca Santori. And I don't think any of us saw Plan C coming from a mile away, or at least I didn't anyway. But I think what the, the best approach to this is to talk about each of these plans Victor had and how it led to the incredible climax of, at the end of Friday's show. So. Plan A being Adam. I mean, this is so interesting to me that pretty early in the week, Victor offered up that he would plead guilty. Oh, I'll just say I did this and go to jail if Adam, you take over my company. Oh, the rest of my family is so ungrateful. I'll plead guilty. I'll make all of this go away. Nobody will hurt anymore if Adam takes over my, com my company. And I guess when I think back about that, I think that 
from the time that Victor first got arrested, from the time he first fainted, uh, calling Adam into the hospital and saying, I want you to take over my company. Uh, I know you I know you will. Uh, it seemed like Victor was counting on Adam. When he felt like he couldn't count on anyone else, he was counting on Adam to understand him to defend him, to keep his seat warm while he was busy dealing with this, this criminal trial nonsense <laughs> that I think we all knew he knew wasn't going to stick ultimately. I mean, he sat there so smugly for most of all of this, didn't seem worried whatsoever. Uh, but I think his hope was really and truly pinned on Adam. The family who loved him, uh, who who supported him through his um, all of his crap. I mean, through all of the thick and the thins and the many other crimes that Victor Newman has committed. Nikki and and Victoria and Nick, they've all been there for him, taking his crap for years. Uh, but, uh, but damn them. Forget them. I mean, specifically Victoria and Nikki betray him once and they're cast out of the kingdom forever. I mean, it's probably been more than once, but it's like whoever's betraying Victor currently is the biggest betrayer and then everything before that is completely forgotten. Well, what about the fact that Adam betrayed you over and over and over again? But yet, all of a sudden, Adam is the ordained one. How arrogant is that? Victor actually used that phrase. He's sitting there smugly toward the beginning of the week, uh, and I think Michael asked him, why aren't you more worried? And he said he's counting on Adam to follow the path for which he was ordained. Really? Really? I mean, wasn't it Adam who was working with Ian Ward? to unleash the Paragon virus upon you. You know, the Paragon virus, which forced you to go into defense mode, hire Marco, put him into Jack's place. Wasn't it Adam who was involved with Paragon? Uh, which, which, by the way, caused a giant fire in the Newman Tower, trapping everyone that you love at the top of the building and almost killing them. Wasn't Adam kind of involved in that? <laughs> Oh, and now he's the savior, right? I, I, I felt bad for Adam almost having all of this pressure put on him because you can tell that Adam is in a place in his life where he's not wanting to deal with this. He's not wanting to be Victor. There is a freedom in not feeling like Victor Newman's son. And in fact, his testimony on the stand was spectacular and it really summed it up and I thought he towed the line really well. Uh, but the fact that Adam was behind the Paragon virus is yet another one of one million examples that nobody in this town has their hands clean. No matter how much we like the character, everybody has got a skeleton in the closet. But I will give Adam an enormous amount of credit for actually going to the Newman family and presenting what Victor uh, his I big idea was. I mean, Adam could have just ran with it. Adam, if he were Luca, could have just taken that deal and gained all of the power in the world. Who cares about the Newmans? Who cares about Victoria? Who cares about Victor? I'll just get the company and I'll run it and I'll be the king of the mountain. But Adam didn't do that. He talked to Chelsea about it. Then he went to the Newmans and presented the idea. I thought that was very mature of him. I mean, even the people who have these negative aspects of their personality are also capable of, of doing the right thing. I think it was the right thing to do. I don't know if you guys think so too. Um, I mean, for crying out loud, I, I, I'm i surprised it didn't work. I really sort of was also counting on plan A. The way YNR was framing specifically Adam's relationship with Chelsea and, and her believing that they were going to have this great new life in Chicago, I thought they're going to, you know, or with his job in Chicago, I thought they're setting this couple up to be torn apart by Adam taking the lead at the company. And it, that's not the direction that it took. Adam made a different decision. And that uh, that was surprising to me that plan A did not work out. Uh, I'm surprised that Victor thought 
that that was going to help him? Was anyone else a little bit confused by the notion that Victor would plead guilty? Uh, pleading guilty does nothing to help him. It actually would have been a worst case scenario. There's no coming back from saying I did this. You can't take it back later. There's no mistrials after that. There's I don't I don't think anyway. I mean, you plead not guilty, you just accept your punishment and I was shocked that Victor would even conceive of that. I mean, it it would it would not it would keep him in jail. It would accomplish nothing in terms of his case, in terms of his freedom, but what it would accomplish. And I think the real reason, the real plan A, the real thing that Victor was counting on, and this, by the way, Chris alluded to in her opening testimony, was revenge. Victor, above his freedom and above everything else, the plan A for Victor was revenge on his family. He didn't care at that point if he got out of prison. What he wanted was to screw over Nikki, to screw over Victoria and Nick and Abby and all of those people that unseated him from his own company. That's what Victor wanted, to hurt the people who love him the most. Plan B was simply to get a mistrial. Victor caught with last week that Michael might actually be working against him. I think he was probably at best hoping that the way Michael threw the trial would be so obvious that the case either gets thrown out or the jury become sympathetic toward him due to the fact that he's had improper representation. And you could really, I think, I think you could smell it on Michael this week. <laughs> I think it was becoming increasingly obvious to Victor that Michael wasn't really formulating a great strategy. Michael's strategy above and beyond everything else was to just give Victor what he wanted, to present Victor's case in, in in Victor's eyes almost. Let's make it, let's tell the story as if Victor were telling it and anybody who is in their right mind can see that the man is an egomaniac making excuses for uh, hurting people and doing horrible things and using in the name of the family and for my business and there was a threat to, to, to cover it all up. So I think Victor, I think Michael was trying to use Victor's own mentality against him and in many ways it was it was a brilliant way to throw his trial but it had become obvious I think also Michael ha was going through a process of accepting his own fate he seemed to feel like you know what I'm gonna throw Victor's trial if it works great justice if it doesn't work I'll be disbarred and I'll just do something else with the rest of my life so Michael is you know, working through the fact that he might very well get caught at this and Cricket was already becoming suspicious. I mean, it, it, it had become clear to more than just Victor. Cricket saw Michael and Phyllis having a conversation at the athletic club that was very heated. And I'm sure Christine was standing there thinking, why would Michael even be having uh, what looked like a strategic <laughs> conversation with Phyllis, who is the, you know, one of the main victims here in Victor's trial? I mean, it, it, the, there's no reason those two people even should have been talking to one another. So I think that the, you know, cr Cricket, Victor, I think they were all not really sure, but had kind of suspected that something wasn't right with Michael. And when it seemed like another little opportunity, another little plan popped up, plan C jumped into effect. Plan C being Luca. <laughs> the last dish plan. Luca had come to Victor on many occasions offering to run the company, offering to help Victor. Uh, so plan C is to reach out to the only person left who actually wants to help him and who actually can help him. Luca has his eyes and ears wide open all week around Genoa City. He is determined to get in with these people and Luca is the one who ends up overhearing a conversation in public between Michael and Lauren indicating that he's going to throw Victor's case. So uh, Luca now knows this big secret. Luca lets Jack know, Luca lets Phyllis know, Luca lets Billy know that he knows the truth. Then 
he goes to Victor and let Victor lets Victor know that Michael has overtly said he's going to throw the trial. So just as things with Michael, I mean, just as Michael is not calling witnesses, not doing cross examinations, not objecting to things he should be uh, objecting to, just as the whole trial is reaching a fever pitch with everyone's testimony, that, that it's, it's, it was so intense and so emotional, just as it is at its peak. And I'm thinking, there is no way that Victor is getting out of this. Victor plays Plan C, the final card, tells Michael, forces Michael to call mysteriously Luca Santori to the stand. M Michael not knowing what Luca's gonna say, but Victor knowing what Luca's gonna say. Luca walks up to the stand, tells everyone that he overheard Michael confessing that he was going to throw Victor's trial. Victor stands up, addresses the judge, tells him he want, tells the judge he wants to fire Michael, then declares that he is going to be his own counsel and first act as new counsel. Victor Newman calls to the stand. Victor Newman. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo! <laughs> In freaking credible. Uh, and, and, uh, and to boot, to boot! I couldn't figure out the whole time why Victor was choosing to sit there in that courtroom in that orange jumpsuit when there was a suit prepared for him. We get, we, we get the preview of the following show where Victor, now being his own counsel, now gonna get his chance to fire back, is in the room suiting up <laughs> and getting ready to come guns ablazing at every single person who stood there and testified toward him. Boom, credits, Young and the Restless theme song, f like filling my house with the, with the beautiful music and me j slack jawed, <laughs> absolutely. Slack jaw. Damn! <laughs> oh. Here's the deal. Michael is screwed. Michael is screwed. He got caught red handed, and I don't think Michael's gonna lie on the stand because. Victor's gonna call everyone. I mean, next week, I mean, this week we saw everybody come in and talking about Victor and saying their piece. Next week, we see <laughs> in, in an entirely unrealistic to reality way, we're gonna see Victor calling every single person on the stand and he's gonna go boom and he's just gonna tell everybody off. He's gonna air their dirty laundry all over the place. And the thing is, Michael's not gonna lie about any of this. I think if, if Michael were to lie about the fact that he was throwing the case, then Victor would call who to the stand? Lauren. Victor would call Lauren. Lauren would be dragged into this entire mess, dragged down with Michael, and Michael doesn't want that. So this conspiracy, this whole thing, will be acknowledged and accepted as truth. It is going to drag Phyllis and Jack and Billy and maybe still Lauren into the whole thing. They're all going to be dragged down with Michael. Cricket already knows it. She already suspected it. She was seeing Phyllis and Michael together. She was watching Michael presenting his case and not cross-examining. Cricket already knew, knew that something was up. So here's what's going to happen. There has to be a plea deal. I, I, like There has got to be some sort of exchange at this point because either Victor Newman and half the town go to jail <laughs> or they let Victor go in exchange for their own freedom. Score one million Victor Newman. Damn, I just, it's, <sighs> it was literally like Victor Newman just took on the entire world and won. The Newmans were afraid of it all week. Too. They were afraid of it last week, too, if we look back. I mean, they were practically wringing their hands, trying to rally around one another, knowing that Victor was going to find a way out of this and that as soon as he got out, their hides were going to be tanned. Can you imagine when Victor actually does get out of jail, the egg that's going to be on Nikki's face, on Victoria's face, on Nick's face, on Abby's face, on everyone's face. <laughs> Oh man, they knew it. 
Did you see the way that all of the Newmans walked into that courtroom? It was like a funeral. They had to meet beforehand to have a little support group <laughs> for what they were about to do. And I can't blame them. It was incredibly hard for everyone. Not only was it hard to testify, but it was hard to watch the trial of a man who is supposed to be larger than life and who is now dragged down to this level. I thought... Uh, Christine's uh, opening argument was incredible. I mean, she says, you know Victor Newman as a rich and famous businessman, but what you don't know is his greatest title, criminal. <laughs> but it's true. And I think we as fans, like I feel like almost what YNR was giving us was this resolution for the fans. Some fans wanted to see Victor pay. Some fans wanted to see Victor rise from the ashes. And we really got all of that. Cricket did not pull any punches. She laid it out and it was true. And I like that she even said before the trial, I'm not afraid of him. I've known him for years. And she straight up told that jury that, you know what, Victor did all of this stuff. He did. I mean, he's not even arguing that he did the Marco thing. Here's, here's the twist. He doesn't feel sorry. He feels justified. And it's true. His obsession with winning at any cost. It's true. I think we as fans maybe needed to hear it. Some fans more than others. Uh, and, and I think that the people in Genoa City needed to hear it. It was incredible. I mean, Christine called all of her witnesses and every single one of them backed up the story. I mean, like, we heard testimony from Jack, oh my gosh, painfully remembering what was done to him. And not only what was done to him, but what he was led to believe that he did. It, it was, it was really difficult to watch Jack, but what the worst part was, was watching Phyllis. I think that throughout the week, I developed such a very strong sense of what Phyllis must be feeling, why she is acting the way that she is. Everything around Phyllis's character this week was very much emotionally developed. We've seen Phyllis tromping around town like a crazy woman, but the past couple of episodes, she's really, really revealed, and Gina Chognoni knocked out of the universe how this character would feel having been violated. Not only mad at what Victor did to her, but mad at what, that she didn't know it. I think, I think it, I got a really clear, acute sense this week of how Phyllis feels toward Victor, but how she feels toward herself and feels guilty for not knowing that it wasn't her husband. The outburst on the stand, I can't even. <laughs> I cannot even. It was so big, it was so brutal. Gina, the look in her eyes, the fury, I mean, everyone had to hold her back. Gina Tognoni gave everything she had and it was right there in the front. I mean, I could see it. There, Every single ounce, every iota of her, her facial expressions, her body expressions, her voice, everything about her told me the story of Phyllis, told me the story of Phyllis's motive. I, I can't even. It was too big. It was just too, too big. And after watching Phyllis's big explosion on the stand, it was too, it was a little bit more of a lesser extent with the Newmans. I mean, we got full testimony from Jack, who is kind of the, he's also the victim here. We, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a piece of the puzzle that maybe hasn't been fully drilled in on in the same way as with Phyllis. I think YNR is giving us Phyllis. They're focusing on Phyllis. They're trying to make us understand her, trying to give us a picture of her character, um, especially probably because it's a newer actress. They're trying to acclimate us to this person. We've seen Jack for ages. We've seen the Jack versus Victor war for ages, but this is Phyllis's time to shine. And in many ways, it seemed like Phyllis as the victim was far, far more elevated than Jack. We saw full testimony from both of them and then just kind of a, uh, a splicing together of testimony from the Newman family, which I thought was really well done. I liked that they did like one word, to, each person had one word to represent Victor and uh, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, 
I had a hard time. I mean, they did the Newman kids and then they separately did Nikki because watching Nikki on that stand try to balance between being Mrs. Victor Newman, balance between loving her husband and feeling like she had to do this for his own good. It's almost like if a child misbehaves, you don't want to punish them, but you know you're punishing them for a reason. I got that sense from her, how hard it was for her to sit there and look at him. And they had pre-discussed, Victoria had already said, this said, I'm not even gonna look at him. I, I'm not gonna be able to say what I need to say if I don't look at him. Nikki did, did look at him. Nikki was looking right at him. And it was such a powerful moment when she said, I love you, and I, but I don't even feel like I know who you are anymore. <laughs> that line right there summed it up perfectly. And there was also, by the way, a nice little moment in the hallway where Nikki's crying on the bench outside of the uh, courtroom. Phyllis has already burst out of the courtroom and had her breakdown, which again just really did rip my heart out, and more so, I think, than anything because of the actress. The actress, I mean, let's give an award to her for this week. Where, where's her Emmy nomination? Because I hope it's there. Um, but there's this great moment where the two women come together, and Phyllis acknowledges, and she didn't really have to do that, given the way Phyllis feels. It would make sense that she would hate Nikki too, but there's this moment where they both sit down together and kind of bond over the fact that they 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 both feel victimized by Victor. It was an incredible week for character development and emotional moments. In fact, I think it was mostly through Wednesday and Thursday's show. There was not a whole lot of forward momentum on plot. It was a lot of exploring characters, listening to what people were saying, giving each character their chance to shine in an emotional way. And I really got to give props to YNR for that because you know, it's so tempting to want that plot twist, to want to be looking for all of the little nooks and holes and crannies and what's going to be the next thing, you know, big thing. But this week, they gave us another element that we needed, which was to understand these characters. This was a big week for emotional development, uh, as, and then the plot twists come later. And unexpectedly, heart-wrenching element of everything that's gone on with Phyllis was the fact that her and her daughter have become disconnected over Victor, which is really a shame. I struggled with identifying and empathizing with Phyllis as she was laying into Summer. It happened at multiple points throughout the week. Summer said that she, she, and she has said from the very beginning that she's publicly supporting Victor, but that she's also been subpoenaed to testify on his behalf. And she is planning on going up there and telling the truth. And I, I gotta give Summer some credit for being her own person and for trying to ferret out the truth from the lies. When you're caught in the middle of some kind of war, a family war, and you're supposed to trust everyone on all sides, I think it is at least smart to try to find out all of the information and make your own decision. I mean, I think that it's a little bit shocking that after viewing all of the information, Summer would still be on Victor's side. But at the same person, at the same time, just because Phyllis is the loudest one doesn't mean that she's the right one. And I don't feel like Phyllis has done a very good job of incorporating Summer and bonding with Summer. She said, I mean, Phyllis feels nothing but her own betrayal and can see nothing beyond it. She says to Summer, I'm your mother, how can you betray me like this? And it seemed so very harsh. If you wanted Summer to understand you, then why not open up to her? Why not include her? Why treat her like she's not her own person? Maybe. Maybe Summer would have understood. I mean, after Phyllis's testimony, she runs out into the hall. Summer follows her. Because part of Phyllis's big c complaint against Victor on the stand was not just what he did to her, but the fact that 
this entire situation has created a break in her relationship with her daughter and Phyllis, of course, feeling that Victor is brainwashing her daughter. Now you're sucking my daughter into your madness and that's totally understandable. But if Phyllis would have opened up to Summer before the trial, the way she did when she burst out of the courtroom, I think maybe that would have changed something because I'm sure that hearing your mother say, I felt violated. Do, do you understand the way that, uh, do you understand really what happened to me? Because if my mother was confiding to me about uh, a, a, this situation in which she felt that, you know, all of this happened to her non-consensually, I, I can't imagine that I would still choose Victor's side. And it, it feels, it does feel strange to me that Summer is does seem to be wanting to give Victor the benefit of the doubt uh, when it is her mother that was affected. It's 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 strange. Um, Summer did express that doubt to Victor after more information comes out on the stand. She goes to see him, and Victor, it's like he. I think he is kind of brainwashing Summer. Do you get that vibe? I I think. I think Summer's trying so earnestly to be her own woman and to make her own decisions and to not just go along with what the Newmans are telling her and just jump on the bandwagon against the leader of their family. Yet at the same time, I don't I just don't know how you could hear everything and and and, and not understand that Victor is manipulating you. I think there's a good possibility that Summer's being manipulated by by both Victor and Luca, but I did appreciate that Victor in his own defense, kind of brought up the fact that Phyllis had sins too, and the fact that she mowed down Christine with her car. I mean, Victor even said it in those words that, did you know that your mother rented a car and mowed down Christine? That was a great thing to bring back because that was a horrific thing that Phyllis's character did. And Victor revealed to Summer that Phyllis was the one who had Adam kidnapped, which I'm still waiting for that to be something or to come up in some kind of larger way. I don't know if it will. Um, but the part where Victor said uh, that, oh yeah, you know, I some there was some BS about him not turning Phyllis in over Adam's kidnapping because he felt guilty about Marco. Nah, I don't buy it. No, nope. <laughs> there's probably some other reason why he didn't do it, but I don't think there's any love lost between Victor and Phyllis this at this point. The way Phyllis has come for Victor, Victor, I, it's I, I can't. It, there's got to be some other alternate reason why he hasn't come for Phyllis because I believe that he would do that with everything he's got. So I, I am curious to hear what your impressions of Summer are this week because she is a little bit of a wild card. I liked. Luca's advice to her. I liked the character development around him as well, where he says there is a day where you have to stand up and you have to be your own person. And in some very real ways, Luca and Summer are from these powerful families and are have been forced to think a certain way or are expected to take a certain side. And they're both kind of buck, uh, bucking against that. So I liked that he connected with her this week. He signed the divorce papers um, and he, he had a moment where he opened up to Summer about it and I believed it. I believed uh, that he was being sincere just by the way he was looking at her and by his actions. I think maybe Luca is not all bad. I did like and I kind of do like that everybody in Genoa City is against them. It creates a little bit of a Romeo and Juliet vibe kind of thing going on that could keep warming me up to Summer and Luca. I, I got it a little bit more this week. And I loved that Nick confronted, he kind of cornered Luca and said, here's the thing, you hurt her, I hurt you. <laughs> Which is great. You want another black eye to match? <laughs> it was fantastic. Now it seems like that relationship with Noah uh, and Marissa is going to be breaking apart. We kind of talked about that a little bit last week that it's sort of doomed in one way or another. Last week's poll question was, should Noah and Marissa get married 
83% said no. So it kind of seems like more people are not on board with the relationship. Although I will say the people who supported Marissa and Noah made some very strong points. I think that more than anything, it's got nothing to do with either two of the characters. I think YNR kind of threw Marissa and Noah together and then didn't follow up on it real well. I don't, I, they didn't do a whole lot to really make me connect with Marissa and Noah. It was just sort of there and accepted. And I mean, she just got out of, of an affair and, 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 you know, and just got out of a marriage and she's ready to marry him. So I don't, there's, I think why in our, the writing could have been better on that couple and I would have been on board with it. Um, but, I thought it was fantastic and fascinating the way Marissa cannot wait to go tell Noah that Luca signed those divorce papers. And, he, you know, he says, Noah had this great, you know, line. Well, actually, okay, what she says to him is, here's what I think. I think that, yes, Luca signed the divorce papers because he wants to be um, with Summer. But I think the bigger thing is that he wants to marry into the Newman family. And Noah, great line, says, who the hell? would want to be a Newman right now. <laughs> it's like the worst last name to have. Now, so is that part of it? I, 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 I can't, I almost can't tell if I'm getting manipulated by Luca because he's so darn charming. Even with that black eye, he is so darn charming. Plus, I mean, it seems like things are kind of working out in Luca's favor and you can't ignore that piece of it. Here's my question for you guys. Uh, Luca did, went up on the stand knew exactly what Victor wanted to say, and he said it sight unseen. He said it whether he knew he was gonna get anything out of it or not. So what is he gonna get out of it? What is Luca's part of the exchange? Does he get control of the company now? Because that's what he initially asked Victor for. You give me, let me run your company, and I'll be on your side. Well, Luca was on Victor's side, so does he get the company now? And I think that at the very least, that's what Luca thinks. I think he he thinks he's going to get the company. So uh, before Victor gets out of prison, are we going to see a brief window next week where Luca Centauri's portrait is hanging on the wall in Victor's office? The scandal. The outrage. The betrayal. Jill gave Billy Abbott the mansion? <laughs> Catherine Chancellor's mansion is now Billy Abbott's single guy pad? Let me just tell you. <laughs> this, you know this had to have been a real big week because I thought to myself, what was it, Monday show? I thought, I'm going to be crazy and open up talking about the YNR chat talking about the fashion of the week. And then when that whole thing went down, I thought, top story. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about Catherine's mansion. What could be bigger than that? And then the whole Victor thing happened and it happened on Friday. So I'm like, I got, got to get that out. But here's, here's the place for it, folks. <laughs> oh my God. I, I cannot even freaking believe, first of all, that Jill would just hand over the mansion to Billy. I, I, I suppose logically it makes sense because it's her son, it's her heir, but first, hey, hey, let me just back way up. Doesn't Esther own half the mansion? Is that why she decided to move out and the whole Colin hit and other thing happened? Was this always Viner's plan to just remodel the mansion and give it to somebody else? Um... <laughs> I should have probably prefaced this by letting you know this is going to be flame. This is going to be fan crazy flaming here, right here. This is fan. It's going to be like fan outrage. So prepare yourself. Um, so, okay, A, Esther. I guess she's just gone in as a complete non factor. B, after everything, everything that Jill did to gain control of that mansion over the years. I mean, the entire 1990s decade and well into the early 2000s, Jill was fighting for control of that house. I 
seem to remember, in fact, I feel like it was mid-90s, when Catherine and Jill were fighting, fighting, fighting over the house, Jill went up into the attic and found some new will of Philip's that gave her half of the control of the house. They, they were in court over it, and it, and it cr created the half ownership of the Chancellor Mansion, and those two women fought Fought, fought, fought. It created drama for years. And now Jill's just handed it over? Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Additionally, I suppose it means that Jill's just gone now. <laughs> Which also is upsetting to me. And then, ugh, okay. I could deal with Billy having it. Here's the thing. I could deal with Billy having the house. What I can't deal with is the fact that they remodeled it and that they've remodeled it in this way. When Billy and Phyllis walked through that door and it was said that it was Catherine's house, but it didn't look like Catherine's house, I blacked out. <laughs> I don't even remember. I forgot who I was, where I was, what show I was watching. Uh, uh, it absolutely threw me for the biggest possible loop. I don't know. I, I, I couldn't even, I was disoriented. I mean, you're telling me that this is Catherine's house and I'm looking around and it's not Catherine's house. <laughs> Where's all the things? Where's all the knicky knacks and the couch and the, all the things? Where's the bureau? Well, I, didn't, I didn't even remember there was a fireplace. The only thing I rec the only two things I recognized from that whole thing were the front door, <laughs> the foyer, and the window. Uh, that's it. I didn't never notice there was a fireplace in there. I I guess here I why? Why redecorate it? Why? It, and and to give us no warning, just to walk in to the room and it's now blue and it's supposed to be Catherine's? I can't. <laughs> I can't deal with this right now, YNR, on top of every other thing. It reminded me instantly of when they burnt down the ranch. Okay, it took me some time to get over that crap, but, I mean, this is Catherine Chancellor. This, this is the single most important set on that show, and it's blue. It's all blue. Couldn't they have, like, tested the waters on the... Why didn't anybody call me? Why didn't they call me and ask me if this would be okay first? It, it's not okay. I don't feel good about it. <laughs> I don't want to see it. I just... It's too soon for another thing. I would have... You know what? Okay. I Here's the thing. Rationally, I understand that we need to move on. I, I understand that Catherine is gone but I want to feel her legacy. I want to feel that she's still there. I understand that Jess Walton doesn't is not forced to be on the show for eternity, and even if she, if she doesn't want to be or if she wants to be with her family or whatever. I get all of that logically, but I would so much rather have had that set and that house drip fade slowly away into the blackness left intact in my mind than to have them out of the blue <laughs> blue decide to rip it all down take all the furniture away take all the knicky knacks away and just make it something completely different uh, what why would billy even want to live there it's a giant it's just no <laughs> Why not just leave it be? I am so flexible about so many things. But not my man, not my Catherine. Come on, have some respect for the history of the show, you guys. I get, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. I mean, ugh, gosh. This is, this, let's get to it. This week's poll question, what do you think about the remodel of the mansion. Go to yrchat.com and not only will you please vote in that poll, but will you please sound off one way or another. I need to know how you feel about Catherine's house being remodeled. Do you like it? Yes. I mean, are you for this? Like, where do you show stand on this issue? This is this is the most important question of the week, you guys. yrchat.com. I need to hear your I need to hear you feeling the way I do, or <laughs> I need to hear you give me, presenting me with the rational side of things. Perhaps 
this is what Catherine wanted. Perhaps this is what Gene Cooper would have wanted to move on, to keep it fresh, to keep the show entertaining. I just don't know why they had to do it. It was unnecessary. If Billy needed to move out, he could have just gone somewhere else. <laughs> But don't, again, don't let that influence me because if you are of a rational sound mind like I am not right now, if you are not full of fan fury over this, I want to hear from you equally as much. So please don't feel like you have to share my rage. I am equally as interested in hearing anybody who wants to say, no, it, you know, it needed it. We need to have a rebirth of the mansion. I'm totally for that too. I'm going to need your help to like orient me and create and get, get me back on team rationale. I just cringe at the idea of Billy Abbott putting a pool table in there. I know he said it as a joke, but oh gosh, there's so many memories. Why you paint them blue? <laughs> Why you gotta paint them blue? <sighs> and I mean, furthermore, frankly, to have the first impression <sighs> of the mansion, the new mansion, to be a place where Billy and Phyllis sort of start this affair. <sighs> Are they doing it to get us crazy? Is this all part of their plan? Are they trying to make me crazy? Is this, is this the, the point? Oh, I just, I, that was not a good introduction. It was a, I knew it was going to happen too. I mean, Phyllis and Billy are becoming closer and closer. Billy can hardly put his pants on without Phyllis at this point. Does she need to feed him too? It's kind of getting ridiculous. I, the thing, I just wish, I, I'm, I can get there for Billy and Phyllis. I was, I, I mean, I, I can jump on board and be like, all right, Billy and Phyllis, it's story. I predicted it was going to happen. We've all been seeing it was going to happen for quite some time now. I, I just, I wish that it would have been in a hotel room in the GCAC. Didn't have to be having an extramarital smooching fest and probably the affair taking place in my Catherine's mansion. <sighs> sitting by the fire, <clears throat> Phyllis and Billy. I, I am thinking to myself, you know, watching them kind of snug down, have their wine, have a blanket. I'm thinking to myself, do these people, do either of these people realize yet that they're falling in love? Um, and then, because <laughs> it seems so obvious from the outside, but then Phyllis or Billy spills the wine bottle and Phyllis tries to crawl over him. Oh, let me just get that wine bottle by crawling on top of you. And then kisses, they kiss. They just start, they just begin kissing. And it happened, I swear to you, I feel that it happened without a second thought. It was the absolute most fluid motion you could have had. As if you were kissing someone that you had known and for 20 years. That's how cozy it was. I, I, I cannot, I, I'm shocked. I am shocked by how easy it actually was on both of their parts. It wasn't just one or the other. I feel after watching it twice <laughs> that both Phyllis and Billy and were in, it was, there was no initiator. It would just, it just happened. It was, it was absolutely scandalous. And that's what tells me that both of them have been thinking it and just not saying it on some level, even if they hadn't fully cognitively realized that they were falling in love or at least wanted one another. The fact that it was so easy and so fluid, I, I think that they both knew it. They absolutely no, knew it. I mean, nobody seemed shocked by it. And half a bottle of wine shouldn't be enough to make you kiss your brother's wife or your husband's brother. I, it's just, like, it, there's just, it, in, it, there's no way that they weren't both thinking it on some level, which makes the whole thing kind of tainted because they were getting cozy. It seems to me like they both wanted it. And in retrospect, I mean, I, I, Phyllis is the one who's having the affair. That I mean, she is given, she's trying to be in a relationship with Jack. Jack didn't do anything to deserve any of this. Poor Jack. <laughs> but here's the thing. In retrospect, I'm realizing that, and maybe you guys caught this too, Billy is not even fighting all that hard for Victoria. I mean, she turned down his silly St. Patrick's Day dog and he just gives up and it's done and he's just accepting the fact that he and Victoria are over when 
this is what they do. He messes up, and then she says, no, I'm never taking you back, Billy. And then he goes, but I'm charming. And then she goes, well, okay. I mean, you know, that's how, that is what their relationship is. And now all of a sudden, this time, it's not that. So why isn't he trying more? Because he's got, he's interested in Phyllis, I think. I mean, did, did you notice this week that Victoria came to visit Billy, and he kind of blew her off. He normally would have taken any opportunity, it's the mother of his children, of a newer baby too. He normally would have taken any opportunity to get up close to her, to talk to her, to use it as an excuse to bring their family back together, and instead he turns her away, in fact, kind of saying, I told you so about Victor. Which, I will give him this, It was he was right to. I mean, Victoria's mad at Victor when he does things to protect them from the threats against the company, and then all of a sudden she goes to Victor for protection from threats against the company. You want to know who the next threat to Newman Enterprises is? It's Hillary. <laughs> I'm telling to predict right now. Hillary's going to be the next CEO of Newman Enterprises. <laughs> Man, if she, she as soon as she catches whiff that there's any kind of instability there, she is going to be vying for that job. Hillary, oh my goodness, she's vicious right now. I had a hard time watching her smooch up on Devon for that million dollar donation for the Albert Winters Foundation. It's just so obvious that she's using sex with him to get what she wants. I don't even, I completely question her motives. I have no idea if she actually loves Devon. I have no idea if she actually loves Neil. I think who the person she's really in love with right now is herself. I mean, she, not only has she gotten what she wanted from the research project, she's now heading that up, but now she wants in to, on the, she wants a board seat on the Abbott Winters Foundation. And she had this great moment at the uh, big launch, the big party, the big gala, where she cannot wait to present her million dollar check. Oh, she is, she just, she didn't even have to dress up for that gala because she was wearing a million dollar check and a billionaire husband on her arm and she's loving every minute of it. She loves standing up there presenting that million buckaroos to the foundation and she loved Goat Nashley into doing the same thing. Oh, whew. I don't know why, but Hillary is really jealous of Ashley for unknown reason. The, the, Ashley's in no position to be jealous of right now. The woman's dying. Well, she used to be. <laughs> oh, hoo -hoo. oh my goodness. Uh, Ashley, oh, she, she, there's, I have some miraculous news for you, everyone. Ashley is on the road to recovery. She's coming back to life. I, I, the, the, the treatment that Dr. Neville has been giving her, <laughs> all of those injections, all of those loving looks and attention, it's bringing her back to life. She, she, Neville has cured her. Let's celebrate with a kiss. <laughs> Yay! This week was so heavy that I, I, I and I, I'm thinking back on, oh, the Ashley and Dr. Neville kiss. Finally, not only being happy that she's well, but just weeks of him looking at her and just, he didn't have to say a word. Just the way he looked at her, the way he calls her Miss Abbott and she just calls him Neville. I I'm so glad. I mean, why and I could have let that be the only thing big that happened in the week. That'd have been big for me. Oh, I, I, it's just thinking back on it, it brings me such delight. I, I will tell you a little thing about me. When I get truly and purely happy and excited about something, I do this thing where I like wiggle my toes. <laughs> It is the purest, most sincere form or indicator that Allie is happy because my feet start moving and my toes start wiggling like back and forth. And, and I was wiggle. And there, there was Allie wiggle toes during that kiss scene. Oh, it was just adorable. Oh, I hope it doesn't become awkward between them. I'd like to see Ashley and Neville just sort of embrace, maybe play a little bit hard to get, but embrace their new relationship because they're wonderful. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I gotta get back to Hillary because the woman just exudes cattiness and it is epic. I mean, the way she explained her ambitiousness 
to Devon back in the hotel room after the gala almost made sense. I mean, she was saying like, you know, Devon, all anybody knows about us is that we cheated on your father while he was blind. Is that really the legacy that you want to have? Don't you want to do something more with Catherine's money? And I agreed with her on that point. And I thought to myself, well, maybe it does give a little bit of a window into her frame of mind and her motive. It's, is it a coincidence that the projects she's choosing to throw herself into are philanthropic? I mean, maybe she actually does want to do something good, but she's just going about it in the most deliciously aggressive way possible. But then again, after she had that conversation with Devon, we saw this scene of her sitting on the bed and she was just giving this like one eyebrow up and a glass of champagne. It was real close on her face and she just looked, you know, extra catty. And I, th I thought, well, shoot, that, I guess I just got played. Maybe it's got nothing to do with the good cause. Maybe Hillary's just power hungry. If it weren't for the entire Catherine's Mansion debacle, which I feel in my soul, I want you to know, <laughs> another one of the top stories this week would have been the fashion. And now I'm, I'm so far in, I think I gotta skip it for the most part. I, I'll give you my best dressed. How about that? Um, I tell you, after several big fashion opportunities that were missed by Phyllis this week, she hit the nail on the head. I absolutely loved the black dress that she was wearing. It was like one long sleeve, one no sleeve, and it had this like geometric cutout on the chest. She had gorgeous earrings. They were simple but beautiful. I loved the hairdo. I just thought she looked incredible. It's so rare. <laughs> She's been such a miss for me for the last, couple, the last couple of events. And then I suppose my best dressed male would have to be Dr. Neville with his bow tie. It takes some guts to wear a bow tie and pull it off and I thought he looked really cute. What was that? A whale print? It was like a blue, blue bow tie and it looked like it had a little white things on it. I thought maybe it was little whales. <laughs> I don't know. Let me know if anybody else could tell what that print was. Um, you know, I, I hate to say it. It's so weird. I, I, I don't know what my deal is. I guess my worst dressed would... I just... I loved the color of Marissa's dress, but I didn't really like the cut of it. Um, it I, I didn't, again, I'm not trying to rag on Marissa lately. I guess it seems like I am. I'm really not meaning to. Um, I thought the color was great. The uh, turquoise earrings that she had went perfectly with it, but it seemed a little almost too casual, too like sundressy for uh, for a big gala event. Uh, I loved Abby's dress in, in the powder blue. The color was outstanding, but did not love those cutouts. You know, I did not love those cutouts. Also, I mean, I don't know. Um, everyone was like, shoot, I, I think I, I lost my mind and was unable to see anything or remember anything after the whole thing with Catherine's mansion. Um, but I thought that I, I kind of was digging a little bit on Summer's weird dress. It was like dark. I couldn't tell the color of it. Um, I don't know if it was dark blue or dark chocolate. I don't know. Maybe it was the color of Catherine's walls. I, everything that I saw after the Catherine's mansion just had this weird blue tint on it for me. <laughs> so so uh, I don't know. How about you guys tell me your best and worst dressed for the gala fashion? Uh, there were a lot of them. A lot of people. I mean, for the most part, I thought everybody looked good. There were no real bad ones, so I felt like I had to pick. But best and worst dressed for the Abbott Winters Foundation Gala. Leave me a comment, let me know. Enjoy your time on Mars. <laughs> that was last week's Who Said It quote. I thought it was just funny. Uh, it was Natalie who said that. I have to resist picking quotes from Natalie because if I, if I focus on Natalie too much. I think I would pick quotes from her every week. She's got so many fun one-liners and enjoy your time on Mars. Seemed like a good one. She was talking to Phyllis and Jack. I think almost everybody got that one. Uh, Adam, Katie, Victoria, Austin, and Naomi. Uh, Connor, Erin, Sharita, and Candita. So congratulations to everybody who got that one right. 
but can you do it again? There was so much drama this week. I don't know if you're gonna catch this one tiny little line. Who said you have mad bull skills? <laughs> I gotta keep it light. This week has been so intense. We'll, we'll keep it light. If you think you know who said the quote, you can go to yrchat.com. Leave your guess. If you get it right, I will give you a big shout out on next week's YNR chat. Who said you have mad bull skills? So much YNR scoop, you guys. I asked everybody last week if they'd like to share any YNR star stories with me, like sightings of the YNR stars or conversations or anything like that, and I got some fun ones. First of all, I'm mad at myself because, ugh, I, I don't know why, but I created a post at the yrchat.com site and I accidentally didn't have the comments on for it. Ugh, dealing with the website stuff is probably not my strong suit, so I'm mad that if anybody if anybody went there to tell me your YNR star story and you couldn't figure out why on earth you couldn't leave a comment, it's because I derped out. <laughs> but the people that did leave comments were really entertaining. I mean, for crying out loud, uh, I got some good ones. Uh, Amanda had like two, two dozen amazing uh, star sightings. Uh, Tony had a, a really good one also, kind of a YNR b, &B uh, story. Uh, Leslie has a really good one. I, oh my gosh, who, who, on Facebook, Shelly and Adrian posted a photo that they had of of Josh Morrow. I got a lot of um, voicemails too, and I th I I didn't want to say anybody, you know, share anybody's story or their name if they didn't like write it down, because you know, I, I don't know. I guess people, you know, I don't. I think people maybe feel like they're bragging if they saw, but we we did have a a couple of people who let's say work behind the scenes and stuff like that uh, and, that had some good stories to share about YNR stars, and pretty much everybody said everyone was really not because I'm always, I'd be paranoid meeting a YNR star that they'd be mean to me or just even, just that it wouldn't be a positive experience, but everybody who did say something said something positive, so that's really fun and cool to know. Um, if you didn't get a chance to share your YNR star story or, and or, if you want to read uh, things that other people have said, other, star, si, si, other sightings that YNR chatters have had, you can also so go to the website at yrchat.com. I swear, I promise that you'll be able to leave your comments and read the other comments this time. I also hinted last week that we are on the cusp of another Genoa City Soap giveaway. So I wanted to just give everyone a heads up real quick that the giveaway soap for soap fans gala for spring <laughs> will be starting next Sunday. So I'm looking at my book here. and <laughs> gotta, gotta plan this stuff out. So the if you come back next Sunday on April 3rd, we're gonna start entries for the giveaway and I'm gonna be announcing the giveaway the following Sunday on April 10th. I hinted last week about the first two soaps that I made being remakes, and I have them now. If you haven't seen them, well, kinda you'll see them. I have Ms. Cricket. How perfect is that for this week, too? This one smells so freaking good to me. And then, of course, I, I had to, couldn't make Cricket without making the Paul. So, if you, I already have these wrapped up. If you want to actually see Mm. See the new these remake soaps. You can go to GenoaCitySoap.com to see them in all of their glory. And I revealed on Saturday the first of the next two new soaps. So when we do the soap giveaway starting next week, there's going to be four soaps that you'll get to choose from and enter into the drawing. The first two were remakes, and the second two are completely new. So while you're at GenoaCitySoap.com, you can check out the first of the new soaps, and I will say it's probably my best one yet. <laughs> 
I did another couple, so you can look forward to seeing who that is on the website. And they're really, really cute and pink and white, and it's different. It's a different one. So you're definitely going to want to see that, read the scent description, and start thinking about which of these soaps you're going to want. Come back next week, and don't forget, because I want everybody to get their chance and get their heads up for winning some handmade YNR inspired soap by Allie. Let's read some soap fan comments. Gary left me a voicemail this week and he says, Oh my God, Allie, I, I just woke up from the most horrible nightmare. I had a dream that, get this, Billy Abbott inherited the Chancellor Mansion, redecorated it, and painted the walls deep, dark, blue. <laughs> like the bottom of the ocean. Oh, my nightmare was horrible. <laughs> I knew instantly what you were leading up to, Gary. I was like, oh, this joke is going to be good. And I was in for it. I was laughing. I, I tell you, I agree. I, and that it made me feel better because I was like, am I going to be the only one making a huge deal out of this? But I, I'll tell you all the rest of the YNR chatters, Gary's angst over the Chancellor Mansion redecorating space and days like I mean I think like at least three days uh, you'd mention it uh, in, in voicemails and I'm with you like 100% uh, it was I feel it I feel like I want to be open and accepting but it was just out of nowhere it was without warning and it was just so shocking to me I'm glad I, I was not alone Anna left a voicemail and she says, Allie, I've been watching for YNR for 30 years. Forget the fact that Hillary wants to take over Genoa City. Forget the fact that Billy and Phyllis kissed. I loved Victor's trial, but the Chancellor Mansion is blue-gray. <laughs> it's a disaster. <laughs> oh man, I'm not alone. <laughs> Connor left me a voicemail saying, Allie, oh, this was good. I'm trying to accept Billy and Phyllis, but the fact that they kissed in Catherine's mansion and they redecorated it with those ugly bluish gray walls, that is the one set that should never have been touched. It's just too disrespectful. I believe, Connor says, that Catherine's estate should go to someone who can bring family values and happy times into the mansion. And right now, that's not Billy. Why not let Kane and Lily live there? They have kids and they have a connection to Catherine. Oh, Connor, it's so... It is so devastating, and I really, I especially love your idea that the Catherine's mansion should have been with, uh, going to someone who can fill it with love and light and laughter, and maybe they will. Maybe it's just so hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel because we're surrounded by the blue. Uh, I, I mean, it's maybe it's one of those things where it just takes long time fans a, a while to adjust. I don't, am I ever going to adjust? I want somebody to tell me if I'm ever going to get over this. <laughs> I don't know. Kim left a comment at yrchat.com and says, I hate Billy and Phyllis right now. I do not understand this so-called relationship. I get their hatred of Victor. I rooted for them to take down Victor. He deserved it, but that is as far as I can go. Now they're making me root against them. They're making out. Where did this come from? And there is no heat in that kiss either. I hate them both. Jack deserves better than a wife that he has done everything for. I mean everything. Did he not just cough up $500 million to protect her? Then you have Billy, who Jack has bailed out his entire life and just recently with his proxy as he laid dying. This is is who they treat like trash? Loathe these characters so much. Jack deserves better. Victoria deserves better. I couldn't have said it even any better myself, Kim. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you nailed it. Ooh. I, I got a feeling that you are not Team Billy and Phyllis from that comment. Um, I, is anybody? I, I mean, I... 
I feel like just from the comments I'm reading, it seems like everyone's kind of having trouble getting on board with this. And it feels like people have been having trouble getting on board with it for weeks now, yet we've steamrolled ahead. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you guys will have to let me know this week how you feel about Philly, Philly, <laughs> I guess that is their couple name, Billy and Phyllis's kiss. Um, if you want to leave comments on the blog, uh, I, I, I got to get this because it's going to carry over into next week. There's no way. I mean, it was the one kiss and then YNR didn't really follow up on it. I mean, there was just so much else going on uh but i imagine they're gonna have to at least address it billy and phyllis kind of did a let's never talk about this again but that ain't gonna happen so i'm assuming it's gonna come back up next week so if you want to leave your comments for me um i will work them into uh next week's YNR chat i actually got a voicemail from jamie it was a really nice voicemail i didn't get it till Oh my goodness, I don't think I got it until Monday. Just if, if it matters to anybody, I usually check voicemails uh, by like Saturday morning, maybe Saturday afternoon, and then I usually don't get to them again before uh, doing the YNR chat. So if you want to sneak in your comment for the current YNR chat, probably do it before like Saturday. But I listen to everything, absolutely everything. Uh, Jamie uh, is a new YNR chatter, but a 20 year YNR fan. So that probably means we started watching it around the same time. Um, and I wish I could have got this voicemail a little earlier. Um, I'm so I'm sorry. But Jamie uh, had mentioned are, are Nikki and Victor going forward? They always break up. She hooks up with someone else. And if, if Nikki and Victor don't get back together, I'd like to see Nikki solo and strong. I agree, Jamie, not only on that point, but you had also kind of alluded to an idea that if you know, like if Nikki and Victor break up, then is there any possibility she's going to hook up with Jack? Because we saw this week the culmination, I don't know culmination, but the fruition of Billy and Phyllis's attraction to one another. Eventually, Jack is going to find out about that, and eventually it's going to ruin Jack and Phyllis's relationship. So is it possible that Phyllis and Billy are going to fully be together, leaving Jack open for something else? And will that something else be Nikki? I don't know, but I think it's a possibility. I think Jamie was saying no to that, uh, but I kind of almost, you hit on something. I kind of almost wonder if it is possible. Uh, oh, gosh. Phaedra <laughs> left a really good voicemail on many levels. <laughs> but the thing that Phaedra said that I couldn't get out of my head the entire week was, I think, basically a complete prediction of what's going to end up happening with Sharon and Sage. Ph Phaedra says, wouldn't it be interesting if Sage goes back to Fairview and runs into Patty again. So I think that is actually where we're going. I couldn't get that out of my mind and I didn't want to take credit for the idea before talking about Sharon and Sage. Um, it's it's got to be coming to a head here. Sharon had a new nightmare this week. She is hearing the baby cry all over the place. She's holding the baby in a baby blanket. She unwraps the baby that she's holding in a blanket and there's nothing inside. And it's so, um, it was such a good representation of what Sharon must know inside that she, you know, she's got the baby. There's the idea of the baby, but when you pull away all of the layers, it's hollow. So now what we've got is both women having nightmares. I don't know if they're going to compare notes <laughs> or what, but Sage, I have kind of talked about and predicted a couple weeks ago that Sage was going to go crazy. I still think that's in the cards. YNR is making it look right now like she is very even-handed. Uh, Nick has a talk with Sage and t lets her know that she's all of her efforts with Sean are making her look worse than she really wants to and really should. So she decided to kind of back off of Sean. She decides to take the job at Chelsea 2.0 and you know along with Sharon and try to put her focus onto something else and all of a sudden Sage is being very rational but Dylan is starting to put together the pieces now. Both women are having the nightmares. I absolutely think Phaedra is right. 
either, you know, one or the other. I don't know which, if it's Sage or if it's Sharon, but the Patty is the key to this whole thing. And even Dylan and Paul were talking about Patty this week. 100% one of those women is going to end up back in Fairview and somehow Patty is going to unlock the secret, which I, or, you know, I guess it's possible too that Dylan will go talk to Patty, but we're still, still wondering where Patty is and how she's going to play into that. Um, Eric, left a voicemail that made me laugh, uh, say, saying that with Sage, Sharon, and Chelsea working together, Chelsea 2.0 should just be called Adam's Gals. <laughs> it really is like the ex-wives club over at Chelsea 2.0. I, I love it though. I think it's going to be fun to see these ladies working together some and, you know, they can continue to be catty with each other elsewhere, but I think this is kind of, kind of a good, uh, getting along for now. Uh, Daisy on Facebook says, I was happy to see Devon tell Neil not to put Hillary on the board. Something is really wrong with her and it looks like Devon is noticing it. Yes. Definitely. It's like Devon kind of knows that he's being snowed and I also appreciated that he kind of gave Neil the heads up about it, but uh, Hillary's possibly going to find out about that. I don't know. And she's not going to be happy. Uh, Katie on Facebook says, don't get me wrong. I love Caddy Hillary, but business rival Caddy Hillary isn't doing it for me. I think it's because it came out of nowhere, but more than anything, I think it's because she knows Ashley's sick and yet still continues to provoke her. It just doesn't seem very classy. Yeah, I know. If I take myself out of it, I totally agree. It's a horrible thing to do. Um, it just happens to be so entertaining to me. <laughs> oh, the best comment I got through the entire week came from Austin and Naomi. They were fiance YNR fans, and this week they became husband and wife YNR fans. How cool would that be to have watching the show, loving the show with your spouse. That's so amazing. Congratulations, Austin and Naomi. Yay! <laughs> Sending lots of YNR chat love from the YNR chat community your way. May your marriage last way longer than Nikki and Victor's. Another long one, <laughs> you guys. I couldn't help myself. I, I wasn't even fronting this week. I knew this was going to be a long way in our chat. There was just too darn much to say, and now it's your turn to say it. Please leave me your comments. You can go to yrchat.com to sound off. I want to hear your thoughts on Billy and Phyllis. I want to hear your thoughts on the Chancellor Mansion <laughs> and everything and anything else that's going on with the show. This current last week of shows or the future next weeks of shows, you can always leave your comments there on the blog or you can go to Facebook, you can go to YouTube, or you can call into the voicemail at 309 588 Four five six nine. You can go to GenoaCitySoap.com. These are like so fragrant sitting here with me now, and you can <laughs> see all the pictures of Cricket and Paul and one of the new soaps. And you can start picking which one you want. And you can come back next week potentially win a bar of soap. I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, and if you want to sign up for the newsletter, there may or may not be a secret giveaway too. You can <laughs> a little additional way. To win. So you can go to GenoaCitySoap.com for all of that stuff. And I love you guys. I will be back next week for lots more fun. Everybody have a good one and I'll see you then. Bye.